where we are and where we're going, each of you might have and would have necessarily a different story than what I'm going to tell. Because this story is kind of my story from my perspective of being here with you for two years. <clears throat> In November of 2010, I came for the first time to this little house church that uh, had a, uh, was meeting in Mike Jong's house, and it had emerged just about a month before. Maybe it, it had started in August, but I think it coalesced and really had its first meetings in, in October. And in November, I showed up as a, as a requested guest speaker. I was pastor of, I, I was an, an M, pastor of another church called The Upper Room. And uh, the members there and my wife worried that this would become too much of a burden on me splitting my duties between our house church and going once a month to this other uh, faith expression. I had, um, <clears throat> I had earlier in the year been diagnosed with a disease that the doctor termed a terminal illness. I was on chemotherapy. My eyes uh, were being ravaged by the disease and the medications that I was taking. I periodically became legally blind in one or the other eye. I believed that helping this house church would be easy <laughs> because I was just a guest speaker in this movement. And I was certain that it would soon be receiving uh, help from the Hmong district or from uh, uh, the church that it came from. I assured my wife that this was easy and simple. It's not the first time I've lied to my wife. <laughs> that was what I said in November and in December. In January, things changed. By then, it became clear that the Hmong district was not only not going to help, but was antagonistic to this church plant. The mothership was antagonistic. Mike's neighbor was antagonistic. She called code enforcement on this thing. And somewhere in the middle of this, I was asked to pastor this church. I came home and I told my wife, things just got more complicated, honey. <laughs> she, was, <clears throat> she was immediately worried about my health and whether or not it would be adversely affected. We had a very active prison ministry going on. Jane was writing to about 25 different women behind the walls. <clears throat> At least two weekends a month, we were visiting people in prison. At the time, a woman was living with us who was paroled to our home. I was also president of the Elk Grove Police Activities League. Talk about some com uh, complications in my life. And now I was adding another church. Jane was worried about my health. I saw a group of primarily 20-somethings who had a love for Jesus, who had a desire to have more with him. They were hurting deeply from the wounds that had been inflicted in getting here. I was honored to serve them, and I believed in a pastorate that released and empowered. And that was the thing that I sensed most out of this group was a desire to step into the fullness of the opportunity that they had here as believers in Christ. Because we were run out of the neighborhood, um, I called up a friend of mine who was pastor of a Seventh-day Adventist church. And within a week, we were able to get ourselves into a church. On that first Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, I say that because I love football. <laughs> but I didn't, but I loved this group and this God that we serve much more than any football game. And on that first Sunday, we spent time doing two things. We prayed a corporate and individual prayer of repentance. We repented from holding anger and hostility at individuals and structures that had treated us badly. We also prayed a prayer of forgiveness, forgiving those same individuals and structures who had done us wrong. We stood up, and we began to grow. I believe in the Bible, and I believe that it is the sole authority in our lives. It clearly calls for the priesthood of the believers, and that is everyone is a Sifu. Everyone is a pastor. Men and women, young and old, all are Sifus. 
the church responded with an explosion of expressions. Paia was on me like, uh, like uh, just on me like a, 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 a doggone scent. She wanted to get CLA going here, and, and, and I said, just, just give us a little bit, and at the start of the year, let's do that. We, uh, there, there, there was an, uh, just an explosion of aggressive evangelism. Uh, Kimberlin and, uh, and Sharon got talking about what are we going to do about, you know, in-reach, outreach, for-reach, all this stuff that we had div divided up in the budget. And they said, we got to do something about evangelism. I got a call out of the blue that, uh, that this evangelism group was meeting. The music uh, program when I first started was, you know, Ping and Marco and, um, and a bad sound system. <laughs> Well, not that bad, but it was, no, it was really a good sound system, but it was just Peng and Marco, and look, look, at its, look what it's done. It began to grow. It began to take shape. It began to do things. Um, we baptized in this last two years, uh, somewhere close to 40 people have made a decision for Christ and been baptized out of this church. Our men's and women's retreats have been a huge success. Uh, women returned from Imagine last year and shared their epic experience and this year, nine more women are going to go down to uh, Imagine next weekend. We started trusting in Jesus with, uh, with his promises, and many started giving an honest tithe. What was amazing for me is this stuff that was happening didn't involve me. That's what church is supposed to be. That's how church is supposed to happen. It's not the Sifu. It's the church because the church is filled with seafoods. I was excited about what this church was doing. In January of this year, I made a promise that if we kept giving at the rate we were giving, we would be, uh, have enough money for a down payment on a million dollar building next year. <clears throat> we just bought a building close to a half million dollars. Feel that. This has been a dizzying journey, and through it all, my health has gotten better. Where are we now? Jerry told me last year or earlier this year, you know, it was a lot easier when we had a common enemy. When we had the other guy to point our finger at, things were a lot easier, and that's true. You see, we're now a church. We're not just a bunch of young professionals trying to express ourselves and our faith in a way that is relevant to us and in a way to share, that shares the gospel with the lost. We're 100 men and women, 20 to 30 kids. Some don't like each other. Some question each other's commitment and love for God and what we're doing here. Some have private sin issues, and the guilt and shame prevent sharing it with God and someone you trust so you can be healed. However, through all of this, God works mightily because he loves us. Two weeks ago, there was a magical explosion of agreement in this church. I've never seen it before at any of the churches I have served, been in, attended, or, or, or had anything to do with. Tuesday night, escrow closed. I drove all over town trying to get there just in time before the escrow office closed uh, up so I could get the keys to this building. Wednesday night, people started showing up. Wednesday night, it was like everybody came here and they all saw we needed to do something. And they started getting stuff and doing stuff. And the walls started getting cleaned, and the pews started getting cleaned, and the carpet started getting the wax out of it, and the filth and the grime that had been here for a while. <clears throat> we stayed here until about 9.30 that night, working. The next day, Thursday, Thursday night, was another one of those epic nights down here. And it was one of those where I would wear out the saints. I wanted to make sure this thing got painted that night. And we stayed here until 10.30 getting that thing done. And I apologize to you and I praise you both at the same time. But it got painted. Friday, all day, people were here. Started in the morning and I think it went until 8.30 or 9 o'clock that night. 
I was off at the upper room doing service there for the last part of that uh, evening. Saturday, we started first thing in the morning. And we stayed here until 9.30 that night. Because some of us had a, had a, a meeting, we, uh, the advisory team meeting that night. But until about 5.30 or 6, we were still blowing off the sidewalk. Uh, Tubi and, and me shoveling and blowing out there. But by that time, oh, we got one of these huge dumpsters. You know, 12 foot tall, 22 feet long. And when it arrived, I looked at Mike and I said, what moron bought this thing? There's no way we'll ever fill this thing. Friday morning, it gets delivered. Saturday at 4 o'clock, it's filled. I'm the moron. <laughs> what was amazing was that everybody undertook the responsibilities that was needed. There was no leader here. There was no shot caller. There was nobody saying, go do this, go do that, go whatever. It was a group of people coming together, understanding we have a responsibility, there is a need, we can fill it. And the only thing that, that happened was the whole congregation as a group was yelling at uh, Meng and Jerry, go buy more, go buy more. We need this, we need that. And the two of them were making you know, trips like crazy down to the Costco, or not Costco, but um, Home Depot and Lowe's and whatnot. On a, either Friday or Saturday, uh, Bishop, Bishop or Reverend Sherwood from the church down, um, it used to be Radiant Life, it's at the Bowling Alley, uh, they, he came by in his brand new Escalade, and he was driving through the parking lot, and uh, he said, can I see what's going on? I said, sure, and I came in, I was showing him, I just walked in, just showing the building and what was happening, and he looked at this, there must have been 60 people here. And he looked at me and he says, you've got an army. And I said, no, God does. <laughs> this was an incredible outpouring of unique agreement. And what I want you to see in that is when we operated in one accord, when we operated with one focus, with one desire, we turned a pig pen into a Bethel in a week. And we must never lose sight of this simple truth. We are all sinners, led by sinners, called by God to lead other sinners to the cross for forgiveness, healing, and transformation, all the while continuously experiencing the same things ourselves. We're a group of people. We have a group of people getting ready to graduate from the elder training, CLA. We have a group of evangelists getting ready to graduate so they can go teach the Bible um, studies to, to people who don't know anything yet. We have a band, an awesome worship band now. We have a mortgage. We have a renter. We are a church with all its warts and pimples. Where are we going? I'd like to ask the uh, praise team to come on up now because... Shortly, they're going to be helping me with this. And I'm going, to, um, I'm going to ask you also to help out. If you hear something that you agree with, I want you to step completely out of any comfort zone you've ever had and just voluntarily say amen. How about that? Amen. All right. I like that now. Now, if you really, really, really like it, you can say it really, really loud, okay? Let's try another one. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> so here's where we're going. Um, I believe that we are not what we're intended to be. I believe God has much more in store for us. I don't think he called you out of uh, where you were to be the first church of this kind to be an uh, English-speaking, primarily Hmong church run by your generation seeking much more than what you had before. I don't think he called you out to be that just to be what we are. 